We are in our series called Signs. Everybody say Signs. And, 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 and you know, like every, I, I believe every church should be teaching on the end times at least once every two years. When you go through your cycle, you teach on family, you teach on finances, you teach on relationships. You pick books of the Bible that you preach on and then you preach Old Testament, New Testament. But you got to do the end times. And because uh, and, we understand that at the end of the day, when God wrote the book of Genesis, he also already had Revelation in mind, right? It wasn't like he was like, oh my gosh, things are going, getting crazy. I need, to, I need to write the book of Revelation to put this all together. No, no, no. He already knew the end. He said he is the Alpha, the Omega. He is the first and the last. Amen? Amen. So thank you, worship team. We're going to move on with our message here today. And today, you know, I've been praying about uh, when I went on my sabbatical for two months and I took a break and went to the Big Island, I just needed time to exhale and just to breathe um, for what the next four months would look like going into January because you all know that crazy things have been happening in our world. And as a result of that, I came out of that time very focused on what our next sermon series would be all the way to January and even into the months of April. When I begin to look at the signs of the times that things are accelerating around us, we seem to be in this vortex where everything is going down and we need to make sense of everything that's happening. A lot of people have gone to YouTube or gone to different channels in order to get their level of news of what they're looking for because they're not getting it from whatever media uh, outlets that they've been looking at over the last few years. And so now we begin to hear words like Armageddon or the second coming. We hear words like the Antichrist, the rapture, or the abomination, the millennium, or the apocalypse. And all of these different term terms are being thrown out. And then it's absolutely confusing unless you read your Bible and you understand that this is where the world eventually will head. I'm not sharing this message with you to instill any fear. I want you to be fully awake, fully aware, but then full of faith in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. So it's not God's intent to conceal, but it is also God's intent to reveal. He wanted to reveal it to us. He revealed it through the scriptures. The first coming of Jesus Christ, the entire Old Testament, pointed to the virgin birth. Um, the, the Old Testament pointed to the resurrection and the ascension into heaven of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the New Testament, especially in the books of Matthew, First and Second Thessalonians, sprinkled throughout the Bible, and even the book of Revelation, talk about his eventual return. So we need to get really good on what it looks like when he does come back in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. So I wanted to give you a timeline. Now, this timeline I'm gonna share with you first is number one, on the left-hand side of the big view, is number one is the church today. This is the church age, okay? So when Jesus ascended into heaven, and then in Acts chapter one, in Acts chapter two, where they were in the upper room and they were praying, that initiated what we call today the church age, the age of the church. Before that, there was no church, there was a temple, there were synagogues, but after that, of course, the Holy Spirit went from being with only maybe two or three people at a time, maybe a king, maybe a prophet in the Old Testament. Now the Holy Spirit is with everyone because of Acts chapter two, where the Holy Spirit came in like a mighty rushing wind. That's why all of us, we've got the Holy Spirit. If you are a born again believer in Jesus Christ, you are the temple of God. He lives inside of you. That's why when we sing, it's gonna come all of a sudden, we under know, come on, sing it, no, just kidding. But we all know that the Holy Spirit is in us, but he's also around us. And this is where we understand not only the omnipotence of Christ, right? We understand the omniscience of Christ. We understand that he is everywhere at one time. He's in me. He's in you. And if he's not in you, then today you get an opportunity to invite him into you in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. So we're in the church age. Now, in the church age, next one comes the rapture, the rapture or the taking away of the saints of Christ. And then it moves into the other one, but we'll talk about the Antichrist later. It's the first one, it's the rapture. There's a lot of controversy about the rapture. Some people have a premillennial view. In other words, they believe that we're going to go through the seven year tribulation period. That's what they believe. They believe that we are going through it. That's what they believe, okay? It's okay to, for them to believe that. The way that I read my Bible is I believe that we will be taken up out of here. Because 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, says, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. So we're not appointed to wrath, 
The wrath comes in the seven-year tribulation period. In that seven-year tribulation period is crazy. I'll tell you more about it, but the rapture, the catching up, the ca- we're going to be caught up in the air with Christ. We're going to meet him in the air, right? How awesome is that, that Jesus actually gets off his throne for the second time and meets us in the air, and we will be out of here. We'll, we will be caught up with him in the clouds, What an incredible opportunity for us. All of a sudden, 2 a.m. in the morning, 2 p.m. in the morning. That's why the Bible says one will be taken, the other will be left behind. Uh, Two men will be working in the field. One will be taken, one will be left behind. Uh, You know what I'm talking about? And so we could, we are very close to that point. We don't know when it's going to happen. As a matter of fact, nobody puts a date on it. Because if they put a date on it, it's not going to work. Because God is just going to move the date. Because why? Because Jesus said, even the Son of Man himself doesn't even know the date. Not even the angels. Only the Father knows that date. When I was young, I went to the Philippines with my grandparents and my mom. And my mom brought a book with her called The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. I was 11 years old. I picked up that book. 11-year-old kid reading about what Hal Lindsey thinks the end of the world will look like. Of course, it shaped the way that I saw the world. It shaped a lot of my thinking during that time. It just, you know, just was very, very interesting. But even those people, even people have put on dates before in the 70s and in the 80s, 99 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1999. Come on, you know what I'm talking about? And all the, oh, Y2K, 2,000 reasons why Jesus is coming back in the year 2000. And we're still here. Come on. And that's why it's real easy to discount end times preaching or teaching because, well, they said he's coming back, but he hasn't coming back yet. And so I don't want you to be deceived and get caught off guard that when that moment comes that you didn't see it coming. And that's why it's very, very important for us to understand that number one is the church today. We are in the church age. Then comes the rapture. And then comes the Antichrist. And the Antichrist, the Bible says, will become, will be called the man of lawlessness. And so he comes with peace, and the Bible tells us in the book of Daniel that he is going to broker peace with, between Israel and the rest of the world. I'm coming to that pretty soon about Israel. He's going to broker peace between Israel and the rest of the world, especially the Muslim world, and they're going to build another temple. And that's why you've been reading about the red heifers. If you've not, then that's okay. The red heifers are very, very important because it's the red heifers that they're going to use in the sacrifice, and it's the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to somehow work out a deal that another temple will be built on Jerusalem. Now, I can tell you this. I've been to Jerusalem three times, and I love Jerusalem. I love Israel. It's the land where the holy book has been written. Everything. I mean, I've walked everywhere, and I can tell you that I've been on that Temple Mount, and the Jews don't own that Temple Mount. It's theirs, but it's disputed territory. Who has the authority? The Muslims have the authority over that. I've been there. There's the Al-Aqsa Mosque there, right over here, the Dome of the Rock. And how that's going to happen is controversial. I don't know how the Antichrist is going to be able to broker peace, but he will. And then they're going to build another temple. Right? And that's in the middle of the three and a half years of the, the, the period of the tribulation. Okay? So now, are you guys okay? Yeah. All right. It's just, it's, it's, okay, keep on. I'm, I'm going to keep going. Yeah. And then, so think about this. During the tribulation period, the temple is rebuilt again. The Antichrist sets up a, an image of himself in the temple where he will be worshipped. Then you've got the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, that get killed in the temple court grounds, and then they come back to life. Crazy, right? I know. All right, so moving right along. And then 144,000 Jews will be converted, and the Bible says that they're going to be the great witnesses. They're going to be the great people who are going to be preaching the gospel. And it all culminates to the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon, why is it called Armageddon? The Armageddon means the Valley of Megiddo. And in Megiddo, and in this valley, is where the last place, the last battle will take place on earth. And I've been to the Valley of Megiddo, and it is wide, and I can see why, that they're calling that where the last, place will, will, the last battle will take place. And then will happen his second coming. Online, watch this, his second coming. So the rapture is when, what? He will come like a thief in the night, the Bible says. During the rapture, like a thief in the night. His second coming is when the whole world will see it, and he comes back with his church. He comes back with his bride. Matthew 24, verse 27 says this, For as the lightning flashes in the east and shines to the west, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. So when he comes like a thief, 
That's the rapture. When, he, when every eye will see, that's the second coming. And that's where the Bible says that every knee shall confess. Every knee, no, knees can't confess. Every <laughs> knee shall bow. <laughs> and every tongue shall confess. Yeah, you think this is easy, huh? All right. I know I make it look easy, but every night, once in a while, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's when we're going to see it. Thank you. And then the Bible tells us that he will usher in his millennial period, thousand-year reign of peace, and then the new Jerusalem will appear. That's the overview. I could do a sermon on each one, the rapture of the church. I can do a full sermon. The Antichrist. I can do two weeks on the Antichrist. I can do, I can do two weeks on seven-year tribulation, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Because why? Because we have to understand that, number one, the signs of these times. Number one, write this down. Israel is the key to understanding of the end times. Israel. It's Israel. It's not America. It's not, it's not, look, look, it's, it, it's not going to be anywhere else. It's going to be Israel. So when you are watching everything that's going on in the world, focus on what's happening with Israel. Whether you agree with it or not, focus on Israel. Because Israel is the epicenter. Israel is, let me tell you, there are dates that you and I will always remember. December 7th, 1941. I'll always remember that date. I wasn't here. But I always remember that date because it was an attack on Pearl Harbor. And what did, what did um, our president say at the time? Um, he said it was a day of infamy. We'll always remember. September 11, 2001. I was there. I mean, I wasn't there, but I was alive. I was a youth pastor. I remember being woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning by my dad to get on and watch the news. Turn on Fox or CNN. Turn on the news, Mike. We are being attacked right now. I'll remember September 11. You know what else I'll always remember? I will remember August 8. Then when Lahaina burned down, August 8, in a matter of seven hours, we lost a town. I'll always remember that. I'll never forget Lahaina. And you know what? I'll always remember, because I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, I'll always remember October 7, tomorrow. Well, we got pulled into, we got pulled into something. Why? Because here's what happened. Hamas came in and in Israel and took 13, what, killed 1,300 innocent Jewish men, women, and children. 290 people were taken hostage. Uh, 250 were taken hostage. 23 of them were U.S. citizens who were abducted into the Gaza Strip of less than 10, uh, the country of less than 10 million people, Israel. For us, if you were to matriculate the numbers, that's 40,000 people, everybody, to us. And what would we do if that happened? We'd be at war like we did in September 11. I mean, right? 9-11. Well, we did it December 7, and that's why Israel is going through what they're going through. Now, let me camp here for a moment because there's incredible amounts of anti-Semitism throughout the world. You think that after World War II, we wouldn't have this? After World War II, after six million Jews were rounded up, put on the Star of David, put in like, like cattle in trains and sent through Germany to places like Dachau and Auschwitz, and when a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer stood up, a minister in, in Germany, and said, this is not right. You know what the church did in Germany? They just sang louder as the trains went by because they couldn't stand hearing the cries of the people on a Sunday. So we forget all about that. And so now the anti-Semitism has swept through our country. It's swept through, our, through, through the world, honestly. And here, well, here's what we hear. We hear words like, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. From the river to the sea. What they're meaning, what they're really meaning. I mean, they may not know what they really mean. But what that means is we don't want any Jews on the planet from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. Think about this for a moment. Why is there so much Jewish hatred. They call it anti-Semitism. Let's call it for what it is. It's Jewish hatred. It's not brand new, everybody. This goes all the way back to the book of Exodus. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Exodus, in the book of Exodus, Pharaoh says, kill all the Hebrew Jewish baby boys and throw them into the Nile River. But Shifra and Pua, sounds like, a, like salt and pepper. You know what I'm saying? I'm Shifra Pua. Never mind. Shifra and Pua, Pua's last name is Ting, Pua Ting. Oh, Pua Ting. Shifra and Pua decide that they're not, they're the Hebrew midwives, and they decide that they're not going to listen to what Pharaoh has to say. So what do they do? They, they disobey his orders. They will not comply. Additionally, the book of Esther. 
in the book of Esther. Read it. It's an incredible story of a beautiful Jewish girl that was hanaid into her uncle's ohana, brought into his family, and then all of a sudden the queen is gone because she disrespects the king. So they do a world, they do a, a kingdom-wide search of beautiful women on who could possibly take King Queen Vashti's place. And her name is Esther. She's gorgeous. She's beautiful. And she, her name is Hadassah. They rename her Esther. And when Mordecai stands up because Haman wants to kill all of the Jews, all of the Jews in the Persian Empire, which is modern-day Iran today, he wants to do that. What, what does she do? She steps up and she comes to the rescue of the Jewish people. The Jewish people have always been hated on. Think about this for a moment. For f every civilization that, that if you did not have your homeland, if you were displaced from your homeland, homeland, in 500 years or less, you lose your culture. But the Jewish people never did. They never lost their culture. They never lost their practices. They never lost their devotion to God. They never, to Yahweh, they never lost it. And so that's why in 1948, when they were given the opportunity again to start their country all over again and re-inhabit that land. That's why Zechariah 2 verse 8 says, whoever touches you, God says, you touch the apple of my eye. What is the apple of your eye? The most sensitive part of your eye. I put contacts on every morning. Every morning, and I know how sensitive eyes can be. God says, if they touch you, you, they're touching my eye. Powerful. See, number two, it's also, which leads us to the regathering of the Jews in Israel. That's another sign. That clock got kicked off on 1948, on May 14, everybody, 1948. The nation was reborn. That's why the book of Isaiah says, can a nation be born in a day? Can a nation be born in a day? It was. It was literally born in a day. The nation of Israel was reborn, and I'm thankful that the U.S. was the first country to recognize her as a nation. It's miraculous that that took place. It's amazing that they were able to keep their national identity for more than 2,000 years after Emperor Titus came in uh, with the Roman Empire in AD 70 and wiped them all out, sent them all away, took them as slaves back to Rome, and they lost their land. And of course, now there's a dispute for the land, and you have Suleiman the Great, you have the Turks, they all come in, the Ottoman Empire, and they all camp out in Israel, and now Israel wants their land back in 1948. And that's why we have the Six-Day War. That's why in 1973, they had what they had, all of those different things, but the land ultimately belonged to Israel. Who gave it to them? God did. In Genesis chapter 12, God gave them the land called the Abrahamic Covenant. So the deed belongs to Israel from the book of, uh, from the book of Genesis, and then in Deuteronomy chapter one, verse eight, when they come out of Egypt, he reinforces it. Watch this, and he says, look, I am giving all this land to you. Go in and occupy it, for it is the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all of their descendants. So that brings us to Ezekiel chapter 37. And I think you're going to find this very interesting if you haven't ever read it before. Ezekiel chapter 37, 38, and 39. In fact, 35 to 30. Let me tell you who Ezekiel was. Ezekiel was a contemporary to Daniel. When Israel had split in two, you had, they retained the name Israel, they went to the north, and Judah kept the name Judah, but they had Jerusalem, and they were the kingdom of the south. Why, did they have, well, why were they split in two? Because of King Solomon's son. When King Solomon's son raised the taxes, okay, wouldn't listen to the godly wisdom of his father, the northern tribes, 10 of them said, we out, and they went north. And they said, we got spirit, we got, you know, yes, we do. And they said, we got Yahweh, how about you? <laughs> and so Judah goes to the south, and they keep Jerusalem. You want that. So you had the tribe of Benjamin and Judah to the south. They retained those two nations, to the, those two tribes to the south. But the other ten, they go north, and they stay up there. And then uh, what you have is two different houses of worship now. They make up a place in Samaria. So we're going to worship in Samaria now. We're going to make our own capital and our own worship. And so now what, the, what does the Lord do? The Lord, because they have been, they, they, they've been worshiping idols, Ashtoreth, Baal, and Molech, you had all of this pagan worship going on in the temples. What does the Lord do? He sends the Assyrians toward them to take them. and do, He warned them with prophets over and over and over and over again. The northern kingdom, they had the best prophets. They had Elijah and Elisha. He sends the best 
in the book of 2 Kings, Elijah and Elisha to the northern kingdom. I said, forget them. Forget them. A prophet has no honor in his own hometown. You're casting pearls to swine. The people are not listening. So, but he sends it to the ones that need him the most. Isn't that how God works in our lives? Yeah. Right, right? Like when you need him the most, he sends you the best. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Right? So anyway, they get deported. They get exiled. Both kingdoms. One to the Assyrian kingdom and the others in Judah and Jerusalem. After prophet, after prophet, after prophet. They won't listen. So he sends the southern kingdom. Sends them to Babylon. Takes the elite first. The religious elite the financial elite, he, he takes all of them first. Who's in that group? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego are four of the many that went in the first deportation. There were four deportations. And when they get there, Daniel is amazing through every regime that changes from Artaxerxes to Xerxes, from Nebuchadnezzar. He is this constant guy that God still uses. It's a picture of the church, everybody. So he uses him, but then... Ezekiel comes in on the second deportation. They're friends. They don't meet very often. And Ezekiel gets visions like crazy. So does Daniel. Daniel gets visions of the end times that we are in. And so does Ezekiel on separate occasions. And so Ezekiel sees in Ezekiel chapter 37. We call it chapter 37. He just wrote it. And it says, the Lord took hold of me and I was carried away by the spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around the, among the bones that covered the valley floor, and they were scattered everywhere across. Everybody say scattered. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. And then he asked me, son of man, can these bones become living people again? Oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know the answer to that. And then he said, speak a prophetic message to these bones. In other words, go to the graveyard and preach to the bones. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to put breath, ruach, the breath of God. I'm going to put breath into you and make you alive again. I will put flesh and muscle on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Then he says in verse 11, then he says to me, son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel that had been scattered. They are saying, we have become old, dry bones. All hope is gone. Our nation is finished. The Lord Yahweh himself is saying, the people are saying our bones are dry. He says we are dead. We have no home. We, we, we've been scattered throughout the world. We are the four corners of the earth because of our sin, God. But then our enemies have pounced on us and we have been, we have been put in extermination camps. Our bones are dried out. He says, our nation is finished. Then it says in verse 12, therefore prophesy to them, son of man, and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says, oh my people, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then when this happens, oh my people, you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you. You will live again, return home to your own land, and then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done what I have said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. So here's several things. Number one, Israel will be scattered. Then he says Israel will be regathered. And then Israel will regain Jerusalem. And then Israel will be ostracized. And that's happening right now. See, the final conflict around the world revolves around Jerusalem. Not London, not New York, not L.A., not Tokyo, not Moscow, not Paris, not Waimanalo. <laughs> Seen a bumper sticker before? Never mind. But Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Everything will turn toward Jerusalem, and it already is happening right now. See, number three the sign of the times is the city of Jerusalem will be the epicenter of the end times. Everything that's going on in the Middle East, everything that's going on in Russia, and I don't know how Ukraine fits into that or how China and Taiwan fits into that or North Korea, but I can tell you this, I'm looking more towards there because I'm reading my Bible. Zechariah chapter 12 verse two to three says, this is what the Lord says in Zechariah, I will make Jerusalem like an intoxicating drink 
that makes the nations nearby stagger when they send their armies to besiege Jerusalem and Judah. And on that day, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock. And all the nations will gather against it to try to move it, but they will only hurt themselves. And that's why I am a proponent. That's why I, I do, we need to support Israel as a country. Amen. Think about this. Number four, after regathering their land, they will be attacked. Okay, it's happening in real time. It happened since 1940. You know the Jewish people, the, the, the state of Israel or the nation of Israel has not had peace, very little peace since 1948 when they, when they took over, when they re-got their land back again. Ezekiel 38, verse 1 to 6, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, now this is where you're going to find this interesting. Again, this is to instill faith and not fear. Can I get an amen? amen? All right, so you can watch this with biblical eyes. Ezekiel chapter 38, this is God. This ain't Mike Kai. This is the Lord. Amen. This is not you. This is the Lord. Now the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel said, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog. Everybody say Gog. Set your face against the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws, lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togoma, from the far north and all its troops, many people are with you. Okay, let's, who's Gog and Magog? When, when God repopulated the earth after Noah, and Noah had three sons, Genesis chapter 10 tells us that this is the account of the families of Shem, Ham, and Jephthah, the three sons of Noah. Many children were born to them after the great flood. Watch this. The descendants of Jephthah were Gomer, Magog, Medai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras. Four names are mentioned in Genesis chapter 10 after the flood that he mentions in Ezekiel about 2,000 years later. So who's Gog? Gog, Magog, well, let me tell you this. So, Magog, and for some of you, it's not Magog, okay? <laughs> I know we get Waipahu right there, Magog. <laughs> I can do that, I'm part Filipino, all right? Relax, <laughs> relax, my mom's half. So who's Magog, or Magog, excuse me? <laughs> Magog, Magog, listen to this. Watch this, and, 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 and watch this. Because we know that nations' borders have all changed in the last 5,000 years. They change, okay? But look at this. Magog. Magog is Russia. Rush. Russia. Russia. Well, the, the, the former Russian dominance of Pakistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan. Stand the man. Keep on going. <laughs> Rosh is a reference to Russia. We can't say with 100% accuracy that Magog is Russia, but we know, we know that Rush is Russia. That is a very good educated guess. Gomer, Gomer, golly. Anybody old enough for that one? You might be the age of my grandparents. So here it is. <laughs> Gomer is considered modern day Turkey. And you know who runs that country? His name is Edrogen. Modern day Kurt Turkey has become hostile to Israel. Libya and Ethiopia. Persia is modern day Iran. They changed their name in 1935 when they had a Shah. And then after they no longer, and the Ayatollahs took over. In 2,600 years, the Bible is saying, Russia, Magog, Persia, Iran are aligned against Israel. Then that's a very bold statement that the Lord is already prophesying that is happening kind of right now. Let me tell you why. Iran has supplied Russia with short-range ballistic missiles for use against Ukraine. In, Ru in turn, Russia shares nuclear development and space technology with Iran. They're forming an alliance. They're already, you can watch the news. It's not biblical necessarily. It's the news. They're forming an alliance. Interesting, right? They're going to come from the north. That's what the Bible's saying. And it's happening before our very eyes. Israel is currently being attacked. Tomorrow is the one year since the Day of Atonement. What, what, yeah, the one year attack on Israel. Tomorrow. 
the, since then, the Iron Dome with the United States of America, the Sling of David, on October 1st, Iran sent 180 missiles toward Israel. Watch your Bible, everybody. Watch Israel. Iran is using their proxies, Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Houthis, to fight for them. And I can't understand why we would send billions of dollars to Iran to use against our allies. And eventually against us? Okay? It's in my notes. I didn't premeditate this. I premeditated this about four days ago, okay? Just so you know. But Israel says that it will retaliate. And they are brilliant. And they're not backing down. But we need to pray for peace of Jerusalem. I don't want war. You don't want war. Because if we have another war there, it's going to take a lot of our people from Hawaii who are going to be enlisted or they're going to be shipped or they're going to they're, they're be deployed and we're going to enter into another conflict, another war, and we can't afford that right now. We're not in a good place to be able to do that. So, Ezekiel 38, verse 18 says that this is what will happen in that day. When Gog attacks the land of Israel, God says, my hot anger will be aroused, declares the sovereign Lord. Can you handle two more points? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Only 10 people said yes. Can you handle two more? Okay. You didn't fight through all this traffic in this parking just to get a 20-minute sermon, did you? No, right? Okay, I'm almost done. Here it is. It's very, very important. Here's number five. What's going to happen next? A spiritual awakening is going to come to Israel. Now, let me say something. There's a lot of collateral damage in war. A lot of people are losing their lives. I think the target is Hamas, is the Houthis. The target is to retaliate against Hezbollah. But a lot of people are dying in the process. I don't subscribe to that or agree with that at all. However, Israel is defending itself. They have every right to defend themselves. And this wouldn't have happened if Hamas didn't break through and take 1,300 people and rape and kill and murder and still hold hostage over 1,300 people. This, we would not be talking about this. I'd be preaching another relationship sermon. So here we are, number five, a spiritual awakening comes to Israel. See, Israel right now doesn't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, I'm not saying everybody. You have Messianic Jews, people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He's already come. We know that. To us, we're waiting for the second coming. To them, they're waiting for the first. But he already came. And so, Romans 11, verse 25 says, I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters. Paul's writing to the church in Rome so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will only last until the full number of Gentiles comes to Christ. If you're not Jewish in this room, we're all Gentiles. I'm a Gentile, you're a Gentile. If you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile. It says, until the full number of Gentiles... How many more Gentiles? How many more of us need to get saved until Christ returns? How many of us are still holding out? And when, when finally, the full number of Gentiles, and then Christ will come. And then he will establish his kingdom on earth. See, the sixth point, and the worship team can come up, is number six, is God is waiting for the fullness of Gentiles. The fullness of Gentiles. He's waiting for every person to get saved. Every person who does not yet believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He is, the window is, the, the door is open. But the, I've told you this, the door will shut. He told us this. As a matter of fact, there are like nine end times parables that Jesus taught, nine of them. The wheat and the tares. The parable of the talents. He's coming back. The parable of the ten bridesmaids. Five with oil, five without. And... When they don't give their lives, when they don't accept him, he closes the door. And the other five are knocking on the door. Let us in, let us in. He goes, I, I, I don't even know you. So we understand that there is a window and then there's a, a time where it, where it closes. And that is the fullness of Gentiles. God is waiting for the fullness of Gentiles. So what does it mean for me and for you that if he's coming back, oh, I shouldn't go college then, Dad. No, I don't need to study then, right? He's coming back any moment right now, right? No. I don't, should I even buy a house right now? Should I even try to advance in my career? Do I even go to college? Yes. 
Because why? Because we don't know the day or the hour, because we have to remember this yet at the same time. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. So the way that He tells time and we tell time is different. But it's getting close. So what do we do in the meantime? Keep taking territory. Keep standing your ground. Keep voting like you need to vote. Keep on moving forward. Turn every house into a house of prayer. Turn this church into a house of prayer. Turn every life, every person that you know, tell them about Jesus. Tell them, invite them to church. Reach more people, multiply disciples, make more leaders. That's what we need to do. That's what we need to do. We're not hunkering down until he comes back. No, 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 no. We are not hunkering down until he comes back. We're going to do everything that he told us to do. We're going to better our lives. We're going to better our community. We're going to better these islands. We're going to better the whole country. Because why? Because we are here. And there will be a moment that we will not be here. And that is when the restrainer leaves. Who's the restrainer? The Holy Spirit is the restrainer. It's in the Bible. He's called the restrainer. And when he, the restrainer leaves, everything will be unrestrained. And in the meantime, pray for people who are being persecuted throughout the world. The church in Iran, the church in China, they cannot, they're meeting underground. They are meeting quietly and secretly, but they're growing like crazy. Persecution makes things grow. And we have the privilege and the honor to live in the United States of America. I'm born and raised Hawaii. I'm Hawaiian. Uh, I, I, I come from the blood of missionaries. And you know what, David Lyman, I, I'm proud of my heritage. But you know what? I'm proud of where we came from. But you know what? We belong to another kingdom. We are not of this world, the Bible tells us. We are not of this world. We are sojourners. We are passing. We are passing through. We're not falling asleep. We are passing through. In the meantime, what do we do? We make this place better. We are salt and light. Salt permeates. Light penetrates. That's what we do. That's who we are. In Jesus' name. Amen? Come on, let's stand to our feet and thank the Lord, everybody. Oh, I landed early. I landed the plane early, everybody. Praise God. Yeah. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord God, that you're moving throughout the earth in places that we don't even know about. There, there are work that you're doing that we haven't even heard about yet. But Father, we want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And Lord, we pray for their leadership, that they would have wisdom, God. Father, we pray that you protect them. Father, we pray for our upcoming elections. As we vote, God, as your people vote, that, Lord, that you would give us the outcome that you desire. And Father, we pray, Lord, for the United States of America, from Alaska to Hawaii to the continental U.S., Puerto Rico, Guam. We pray for our allies. We pray for your protection and blessing and favor over our countries. Father, we pray, Lord, we don't even know the whole story, but, Lord, we know that you do. And so, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would continue to stave off another war. Father, we pray for peace of Jerusalem. We pray for the peace over these islands. And God, we pray that people would come to know you as Lord and Savior in incredible ways. And so, Lord, we offer this time to you. We want to thank you that you care about our personal needs, not just our nation. We have personal needs. We have personal needs. We have broken hearts. We have diseases and cancer. We have people who are stressed out, who are depressed, who are going through anxiety right now. They, they're not the same like they used to be, Lord. They've been through the ringer. They've been through things. Father, we need you to come, not just nationally or internationally. We need you to come. We have sons and daughters who are not walking with Jesus. We need you to come into their lives, Lord. We have grandchildren that we are estranged from. We need them. We need them back into our folds. We have friends we have family members that we care deeply about, but they don't understand what we understand. They don't know what we know, and so we're, we're not close like we used to be. Lord, I pray that you repair relationships. We need you now. We need you now more than ever before in our own lives and in this state and country in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed for a moment. I want to give you, look, if you've never given your life to Jesus, what are you waiting for? Today's the day, like you never know, the day or the hour, whether you're pre-millennial, post-millennial, whatever, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, what does matter? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Would you be one of the people left behind? Would you be one of the bridesmaids left outside or would you be in the house? I wanna give you an opportunity to give your life to Jesus, to make him the Lord and Savior of your life from the front row to the back row.
to my left side, to the right side, everybody online. If that's you today, they say, you know, Mike, I want Jesus in my heart. You know, the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And he came. And he took the sins of all humanity, mine and yours. Because the Bible says none of us is without sin. Only one, his name is Jesus. And if you believe in him, you will not perish, but you will have everlasting life. In other words, you can die once, live twice. Or you can live once and die twice. What's the second death? Eternal separation from God. Because there's only two places. There's a heaven and a hell. There's no purgatory. There's no reincarnation. You get one shot at this life. One shot. One life. And let's live it to the fullest. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, I come that you might have life and have it abundantly. In the midst of this craziness, you can have a full life. Come on, I don't care if you're 13. I don't care if you're 73. Today's the day. Raise your hand at the count of three with me, okay? And I'm going to pray out loud. You're going to pray. The whole church will pray with you, like out loud. If that's you, get ready. Front row, back row, left side, right side, online, at the count of three. Here we go. One. He will never let you down, okay? Two, for God loved the world so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross and pay the penalty for my sins and your sins. Here we go, one, two, three. Put your hand up if that's you. It says, Mike, that's me, that's me, that's me. Got hands all over the house. Hands all over going up. Come on, anybody else? So Mike, that's me. Hands up, amen. I see that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand. That hand in the back, amen so many hands I want you to I see that hand yeah and that one right there come on there's still some time there's still some time right there mm -hmm. amen amen okay you can put your hand down awesome I got that I want everybody to repeat this prayer after me say Jesus today I surrender and give you my life thank you for dying on the cross shedding your blood that washes my sins as white as snow I also thank you that when I die, I'll be in your presence for all eternity. But while I'm here, be my strength for today, my hope for tomorrow, my ever-present help in my time of need. You're my God. I'm your child. The old is past. The new has begun. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus, created to serve you and to bring you glory. So mold me and shape me. Lead me, guide me, heal me, fill me, use me, and send me to fulfill your call on my life. In Jesus' name I pray, and everybody said, amen. Come on, can we thank the Lord, everybody?